So hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining the webinar. Uh, I'm Pranika and I'm working at Edelweiss Connect. Uh, and I'm a PhD student. I'm in the last uh, semester of my PhD. And I've been with Temposic data during my PhD as well. So uh, today I will share you my experience on dealing with Temposic data with respect to its management, analysis, and visualization. If you have any questions, you can stop me in between or also can ask me in the end. So quickly starting with the contents of the, of the presentation. So I would be introducing you to the concept of TempoSec data a little bit, not going a lot of into the detail. The main things which I would be focusing on during my presentation would be on the data management, how it is done and why is it important. Then how, what is the TempoSec data analysis workflow, which is the more uh, main core of this presentation today to just give you a taste of how this data can be analyzed. Then uh, going into a little bit of uh, uh, depth on quality control, why is it important? What kind of techniques you can use to actually see the quality of your data? Then going on to the package, which is used in language R to analyze TempoSec data, just showing you what all features are included in it, what the, uh, on what principles was this package built. And then I would go into the data visualization, like just, just introduce you to some tools which you can use in R to visualize your data, your raw data or your normalized data or your differentially expressed data. So I can then introduce you to different uh, tools which you can also use. And in the end, I would just give you a short introduction on how you can also do your pathway enrichment and to see which pathways are activated or are they actually activated or not, or they're only activated by chance. So for that, there is also a technique to kind of determine that. So I would also introduce to the concept of that. So quickly starting with what TempoSec is, I don't know how many of you already about, know about this technology, but this is also a next generation sequencing technology like RNA-seq, which is more famous and is, is being used widely nowadays. It measures an expression of around 21,100 transcripts, so much lesser than what uh, RNA-seq does. It only requires picograms of, our, of total RNA per sample, and it's very, very compatible with uh, cell lysates or purified RNA samples. And it's, it's known to be a very scalable and a targeted assay, so it measures the transcript of interest, so it does not actually cover the whole genome, but it just covers the the transcript or the genome part, which is of interest. It has more throughput and have uh, and also require lower depth than an RNA-seq technology does. So that is an advantage of its over RNA-seq. And it also has a highly expressed genes. So um, introducing uh, this, uh, after this, I would really go to the TempoSeq data analysis pipeline for which you have all gathered here. So the data which comes from the, from the, from the people who process your samples to get the raw read uh, count data uh, is in FASTAQ files. So FASTAQ files are actually a bunch of files in which you have the sequence, the biological sequence, along, along with some, some quality control report and things like this. But this data is actually not readable by a person who wants to then analyze and interpret it. So the first step in analyzing this data is to do the pre-processing of the data. The various steps which you have to do to get to the, to the data which then can be read by you and can then be analyzed by your, by your algorithms or the technique which you want to use. So the first uh, step is the quality control. So the quality control is done using FASTA QC tool. It's a tool which is uh, widely known to also do quality control in RNA-seq data. I would not go a lot of into depth of, of it, but just introduce you onto the on, on a superficial level that what are the steps which are done before you start doing the differential expression analysis. Then after the quality control, you check if your data looks nice, the alignment are red, what are the GC content, how are the sequences, are there a lot of duplicated sequences? So all these things are actually captured and seen using quality control. Once you see that, you do the alignment of your, of your uh, FASTA files 
to the reference genome. So the reference genome could be anything for which you have done the experiment on. It can be of your human genome if you have done experiments on the human uh, cells. It could be from mouse, rat, or whatever is your organism of uh, experiment. So there are different uh, algorithms which you can also use in tools like star alignment, you have SAM tools, Bauti, many other alignment techniques which can you, you use to then get the alignment for your, for your different FASTA files, for your different samples. Once you have the alignment, the last step is to get the feature extraction. So with the feature extraction, I mean the raw read counts. So the raw read counts are derived using a uh, many other tools like one one of the tool which i have personally used is htcq so it's a tool which will actually derive the raw read counts of your uh, for, for every uh, sample and for every gene in that sample to get you the raw read counts once after after this pre processing now you have a matrix of raw read counts for each sample so you have now a lot of uh, probes which were or the probes which are which were measured during your experiment in this tempo sick technology and you will get raw read count for each gene each sample for, uh, for which you have done the experiment once you have that the next step would be to do a quality control on these read counts so there's a quality control method again after you have the raw read counts to see how your sample looks like if the samples are of good quality or not if there are any outliers if there is a noise are there any low read count probes or genes which are in your data? So all these kind of things should be done before you start doing the uh, analysis or before you start doing any, any interpretation of your data. So that in the end, you're only left with the most important and significant data. After that, the next step would be doing the normalization of this data. So DESEC2 is a package in R, which I uh, preferably used and I would also recommend to use has a inbuilt method of normalize, normalizing the data uh, from TempoSec. So that is the method which you can use to normalize your data. And then uh, you can use the same um, package to also do the differential expression analysis to get the statistical values of your data. For example, log full changes, base mean, and uh, p-values, adjusted p-values, and things like this. Once you have your... Uh, data uh, uh, once you have performed a differential expression analysis and you have all the statistical values your next step would be to interpret this data and that is the most important step and is entirely based on what you want to see uh, what is your scientific question because this last part of your analysis would really be something which you would have to decide based on what kind of analysis what kind of scientific questions you want to get out of your data so there are different techniques which I would just introduce you later. So some di Venn diagrams, heat maps, you can do some, some bar plots, box plots, which you can use to see your data, how it looks like, depending on what you want to, in the end, have uh, being answered. And then, of course, you can also do pathway enrichment analysis to see which pathways are activated, at what condition, if they are significantly activated or not. So this was just an overview and a workflow of how the TempoSec data analysis pipeline works. Uh, this is just a graphical representation of what I just introduced you guys to. So you have this data which is uploaded, you do the quality check. So this is actually in the first part where you have the pre-processing of the data. After your data is pre-processed, the quality check is done. You do the normalization, you go for the differential expression analysis, and then you have different routes to go. You can do the enrichment analysis using different tools, or you can go to heat map to see and uh, visualize how your data looks like. You can do the uh, PC analysis, the uh, principal component analysis to see how your different uh, samples in a group are uh, clustering to see if they are closer or not. You can have some bar plots to see the expression of different genes in different conditions. So you have different ways to do this. Uh, before I uh, get into more into detail of the DSEC2 package, how it do the differential expression analysis, I would quickly would like to introduce you to the concept of data management. So data management is a very wide uh, field, but um, in, in, in few words, I would say that data management is the most important part of 
the analysis before the analysis and also after the analysis. If your data is not properly managed or in, in a way, or if it is not uh, accessible, findable, or reusable, or understandable, then it's off. <laughs> it's it's just, a, just a series of number which you would not understand. So the most important thing is that you have to make your data very findable, interoperable, so it can be inter interoperable, it can be reused by somebody. So if tomorrow you leave your, your company or your institute, your university, the next person can also make use of this data. So it's very important that you define your data in a way that it's 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 reusable both by humans and also it is uh, reusable and understandable by machines as well in which you have to, in which you would feed it to analyze it. So the most important, the foremost step after you have the raw data is to then, then make a metadata file. So metadata is data about data in simple language. It means that you describe your raw data. What does this particular sample means? So which condition were actually this sample was created for? So there is a sample A. I would have a metadata file in which I would create and write, okay, sample A, the exposure time was this. It was given this much dose. This compound was tested. Was it a treatment sample or was it a was it a control sample and things like this? So there, there are different attributes or uh, or variables which you can assign to these samples to define them, so that you understand that what you have in the raw read count data uh, for different sample, what does it mean? For which conditions are you seeing these different values? And how do we do that? So there are five most important things which you have to keep in your mind when you create your metadata file is to first assign them globally unique and persistent identifiers so that tomorrow if for example i use your data i can understand what this particular sample means so you have to create your identifiers in a way that somebody can can understand what this particular sample is for it should be retrievable so whatever identifiers we have assigned to them you can retrieve them using some standardized protocol or through some 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 uh, a standardized platform which you uh, would develop or which you already have in your lab or in your institute. Uh, it should use a language uh, which is formal, accessible, and also standardized for, for representing the knowledge. So for example, if, if I have to define an attribute to by using sample type, I should know if, it, if it's treated. At, so everybody knows what's a treatment and a control is. But tomorrow, if you use another word in your own language, then I would not understand what type of sample it is. So it's very, very important that the language which you use is understandable by most of the scientific community. And then the last one is what I told you before, that this metadata should be defined with accurate and relevant attributes or variables. So everything which can define your different samples in this case should be added in your metadata file. What was the exposure time? What was the differentiation time? What was the different treatments or different time points at which the data was collected? What was the, the compound name and all these kind of things? What are the biological, is it the first biological replicate? Is it a technical replicate? So all these things should be defined for each sample in our metadata file. Then, it, then that would be very easier for you to also interpret your data in the end and also easier for the machine or the computer to also process your data. So this is just a small representation of how I did it during my project. So we had some, some experimental people who were generating the data, doing the experiments. So all this data was harmonized. They were giving unique identifiers, each sample which every experiment in every lab had created. So we had a central repository in, in Edelweiss Connect called Edelweiss Data. So we uploaded this data because we have this common fields and common attributes which define the different kind of samples which were generated during the, during the uh, project from different labs. And then you could access this data using these identifiers and analyze it. So in the analysis, you can then do the visualization, interpretation. You can also do comparative analysis. So you can take uh, data from someone's experiment and from your experiment because they were defined using similar uh, attributes in the metadata that could also actually help you to compare your data with each other's. Uh, the next thing which I would now talk about is the quality control. 
So quality control, like I said, is the most important and the foremost step before you start the data analysis after data management. So it wh why is it important? Because it highlights the most important problems which you might have in your data, the most important issues which you have in the data. You can remove outliers, you can remove bad data, you can remove noise if you do the quality control. Because everything which you feed in your data, in, in your analysis pipeline, is going to affect your statistics in the end. So if you do not consider all this, uh, the quality control techniques before you do the uh, analysis, then you would not be so confident in on relying uh, on the results which you would get from the analysis. So it's very important that you that you do this before you do any analysis. And in the end, it also helps you focus on the most important and the most significant part of the data. So when you create data, I mean, you cannot do the experiments 100% perfect. So there would always be noise and outlier. But using quality control methods, you can actually, to an extent, not completely, remove such kind of data which is of not interest and only focus on the important one. I will quickly give you a small example of how quality control is. I, I mean, how I uh, use different methods to do the quality control. So like, for example, you see here, it's, it's a principal component analysis plot in which it shows the variance among different samples. So all these dots are, represent the samples and the dots which belong to the same color are actually the biological replicates which belong to one group. So you see that these three dots here are in very different directions. So they show that they are not so um, um, close to each other. Even if they are biological replicates, they're not clustering very close to each other. This shows that they have biological variability between them. So these kind of issues can be, can be detected and can be seen through such PCA plots. And after you see such kind of issues, you can go back to your raw data do some kind of more statistical method. So you can use Pearson coefficient, correlation uh, coefficients. You can use other correlation coefficient uh, uh, formula to calculate the correlation between different replicates uh, from, from particular condition to see if they're really similar or not. So such kind of quality control methods can actually help you visualize a problem uh, with the, before you do any analysis. And then the second example, which I would like to show you is on the box plot, which is on the right hand side. So you see that this one, two, three uh, samples are actually the replicate sample, which belong to uh, uh, group A. And this one, two, three are the biological replicates, which belong to group B. So in the group A, you see that the, raw, so these are the raw rate counts. So these are the genes and these are the raw rate counts. So the genes you see here, the raw read counts for the genes in, in replicate one and two are very similar, but you see in the replicate three, there are almost no read counts for, for, the, for the genes. It's almost zero. And you see the similar thing also in the another group. So this gives you a flag that there is a problem with the third replicate in both of these groups. So this means that you have to go back and, and, and remove the samples before you do the analysis, because the the, the biological replicates should be similar in one group. If they are not similar, then there is something which wrong happened in the experiment or in the pre-processing or I don't know what. So it is, it is very important that you detect such kind of uh, faulty samples before you start uh, doing the analysis. Um, then there is another quality control which you can do, do on the probe level or on the gene level, which you get from the, from the raw read count data. So you have to remove the genes which have the low read counts. So if there are low read counts, and the low read counts can be due to different uh, uh, problems while your data was being sequenced, it was not sequenced properly. So the low read counts can be a result of such kind of errors which happen while doing the experiments or while sequencing the, the data when, once you send the samples to the, to the place where your data is sequenced. So these kind of genes should be removed before uh, you do the analysis. One, because if you have a lot of samples in your data, it is going to slow down your computing. So if you already get rid of such kind of genes, which in the end are not going to be interesting for you, is going to help you also reduce your computing uh, uh, power and also help you get the results faster. 
decent has an inbuilt feature to do so. so it does an independent filtering of every gene and it flags them so it gives no statistical values in the end for such genes so it calculates a threshold uh, automatically inside by looking at different uh, read counts and then it it creates a flag for such kind of genes additionally you can also filter such genes by using a function called rowsum it's also an inbuilt function in dsec2 what it does it calculates the sum of the read counts for a gene in all samples so you have in total the sum of all the read counts for a gene in all the samples for, i mean for which you have done the experiment so in the end you can set a threshold for example if i have six samples i would say that a, a gene a all the genes should have at least a sum of read count of more than 10 if it does not have a sum of read count of more than 10 i would not use this gene and remove this gene before i do the analysis so these kind of techniques you can use to actually um to do the quality control on your data and to remove such kind of not so interesting genes in your data uh also like i said uh, like i showed an example before for the samples it's very very important that the samples uh, like for example the sample which are with the low read counts also affect so if there is a sample which has all the genes which have very low read counts like 0 1 or 2 should also be uh, discarded so it does affect the statistical calculation because it creates a large amount of distortion like i also showed you here so this third replicate is so has such low read counts as compared to the other that it should be discarded one because it's not similar to the others and second it would not contribute uh, significantly to the statistical calculations but in order to do so the most important thing is that you should have at least three biological replicates or more if you do not have three biological replicate it would be very difficult for you to see which one is a good uh, sample which one is a bad sample for example if you just if you just had the second replicate and the third replicate and one is showing so many read counts and this is showing this read count it would be very difficult for you to which to rely on because you don't know but if you have more than th more than two replicates three or four and three or four like out of four three are showing very similar read count distribution then you are sure about it then you you know that this one is a faulty one and these ones are the, uh, are the ones which are more uh, closer and could be relied more on to do the analysis so uh then moving on to the dsec2 package uh, which performs the normalization and also the differential expression analysis so there are three some some minimum things which you would require as an input for the dsec2 package one is your raw read count file which you would get for every sample you have the raw read counts for every probe or every gene which you have in the data then the metadata file which i just introduced to you before how to create it which describe your samples uh, for which you have got the raw read uh, count data so what kind of conditions were there by law if it is a biological replicate one if it is a technical all these conditions which would define the metadata then there are three things which are very very important for dsec2 other than this is that the order uh, in the raw data file and in the metadata file of the samples because in the end the data is about the samples and then the sample contain the genes so samples are the common factor in common variable in both of these files so the order of them should be same so that the dsec2 package know that okay on the first place it's the it's the sample one in raw read count file and also in the metadata file then the second thing would be that you should have at least three biological replicates like i said like i told you before why is it important so you should have at least three biological replicates otherwise the statistical values which dsec2 gives are not reliable based on my experience also you need to define the sample type uh, for your for your data so which samples are treatment samples which sample are control sample because in the in the end the differential expression analysis which you want to perform is to see the relative expression between uh, two kind of conditions for so so the most common is to see what is the relative expression uh, of treatment of this particular gene with respect to their control uh, samples so this is something which you have to also keep in mind to define that in your metadata file 
so you can create group ids for them so all the biological replicates which are in the um uh yeah, in your metadata file can have a same group ID so that you know that it belongs to group A, which which has a which was treated by, for example, cadmium and had five mu m concentration of cadmium and was done at uh, 24 hours, something like this. So this is something which you have to also keep in mind before you do the DCT. Uh, before I move forward, does anybody have any questions so far? Something is not clear. I think, okay, so I take the <laughs> silence as no. <laughs> so I'll move forward then. So the next step in DSEC2 uh, is to do the normalization. Once you have everything sorted in the way like I introduced to you before, you have all the input files, you have all the necessary things which you have to check before you start the analysis is then to do the normalization. Why do we need normalization? So normalization is a method that will help you scale your data because your data is done, so your data is from different samples. You can never have it like, you know, something, the sample one would have been in different conditions, sample two would have. So there's a lot of uh, variation which could be caused. So the best way to do a comparative analysis or an exploratory analysis or visualization of the data is to bring it to one scale. Otherwise, you cannot data or do something about it. So it's very, it's, it's the most important step in the dip before the differential expression analysis to have to normalize this data, to bring it to one scale too, so that you are able to then rely on the on the differential expression analysis. So DSEC2 has an inbuilt method, which is called median of ratios method. It, what does it does? It does not transfer so your data is still raw, like, you know, not touched. It does not create any statistical value. It just uses normalization factors. So it uses a, it uses a statistical testing method. And the factors which it includes is uh, sequencing depth and the composition of RNA in a sample. So these are the two very important factors while the sequencing is done to determine the quality. So these are both the factors which it actually takes into account does the normalization. I will now briefly go through the normalization technique. Uh, just, just give you a like, so this is, these are all inbuilt features in DSEC2. You don't have to write a code or something for it, but I would still uh, like to explain you how the normalization method is done in DSEC2. So the first thing which it does is, so for example, you have uh, these genes here and the, the read count or the expressions were uh, measured in sample A, sample B. So what is the first thing which the normalization does? It, it calculates the mean of this, uh, for, for this gene in different samples. So here it calculated the mean of gene this in sample A and sample B. And like this, it does for all the other genes. Then what it does, it, it calculates a ratio of uh, each sample. So what it does, it takes the read count value of sample A and divide it with this mean. And it does it for every sample. So it does it for sample B as well and for all the genes. Once you have these values now for all the genes which are in your data, it would then uh, calculate a normalization factor for a particular, for that particular sample. So that would be the median of all these ratios which were calculated here. So it would calculate a median for each sample. So once you have this median, which is which is called normalization factor, it would then uh, calculate the normalized counts. And how the normalized counts are calculated then? They would take the read counts from here for each sample for a gene and then divide it with the, with the normalization factor. So the, the biggest advantage of using this normalization method, which DSEC2 uses, and I personally prefer it, is because it uses both mean and median. So mean and median have their both advantages and disadvantages, but in this particular package, they are actually using a mixture of it. So it's, I think, more reliable than either of the methods. So this is something which can then, like, yeah, give you more reliable statistics later when you do the differential expression analysis. So after we have the normalization now, uh, the next thing is to do the differential expression analysis. So the question is, why do we want to do a differential expression analysis? What does it do? So 
the main idea behind differential expression analysis is to determine whether the mean expression values of the different sample groups are different are significantly different or not what does it mean so for example here you have one kind of group a and another kind of pink i would say red yeah so red group b so we want to see how different are this group from each other so imagine you calculate a global mean for all the values for all the samples which are from different condition this is your global mean which is in yellow, yellow. then in pink you have the group group mean for this for, for group a and then you have the group mean for uh, the red one which is group b but now you see that the deviations between the group the the different group means from the global mean is a lot that means that the group this one and the group a and group b are significantly different they are not similar they are different on the other hand if you have a condition like this in which your group a and group b are kind of mixed and your uh, your global mean is very very closer to the group means so there is not a lot of difference here so you can say that there is not a significant there is a difference but it's not significant difference so this is something which you want to determine using differential expression analysis for example you want to see if my samples in if my genes in the treatment are significantly expressed with respect to the control where i did not put any any drug or any chemical on my cells for example is it are the genes differentially expressed or not something happened to my genes or not so this is this is a way that can help you determine that i would now like um, would not go so much into detail how they do this differential expression analysis but i would still like to introduce you to the terms which and the, and the different mathematical functions which they use in the dsec2 so these are all inbuilt functions but it's always better to understand how are they doing it within this package so there are five different step which they use to come to the statistical values first is estimating the size factors in which you have all the uh, you have the calculated uh, normalization factors like i showed you before so these ones so these are the size factors these are also called normalization factors so this is the first input which goes into your differential expression pipeline then the second thing which they estimate is the gene wise dispersion i'll come later uh, i'll come to the dispersion in my later slides then the third is the they try to fit the curve to this dis dispersions as gene wise dispersion estimates the fourth is they try to shrink them they try to fit them a little bit so there's not a lot of dispersion between the genes in 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 um, similar replicates or in one group and then in the end it tries to do the fitting using generalized linear model for each of the genes so coming on to the dispersion so what does dispersion means dispersion means when you compare a gene expressions between groups it is important to know how much variability is there in the group as in how much variability is there in the different replicates which belong to the same group so if it is a treatment uh, so for example you have treated a, uh, tre you have treatment samples uh, three biological replicates for a treatment sample how much variability they have ideally you would expect that they would be very very similar because they are biological replicates but sometimes they are not because of various errors in the experiment or various errors in the sequencing or a lot of factors so this is something which is very important to see so for this that's why i told you in the beginning that it's very important that you have at least three biological replicates to get to such kind of things in the dsec2 package so what it does it creates a dispersion value which is a square of the biological coefficient of variation so what is the biological coefficient of variation it is uh, so for example if you have a gene and its expression differ from one rep replicate to the another replicate sample for example by 20% so your so your gene's biological coefficient of variation would would be 20 by 100 so that is 0.2 and then you can calculate the gene's dispersion by squaring so it's 0.04 which is not so much but imagine if you have another sample in which you have i don't know 90% uh, variability then your gene dispersion would increase 
so much because uh, your variability your your uh, variation coefficient was a lot so this person actually help you estimate uh, this and what it assume is that the g of a similar expression would have similar dispersion so if there is g1 and g2 in different samples then it would actually have similar dispersion and this is the method which they use it's a mathematical uh, function which they use so i would not go so much into depth of it so the method which they use is called maximum likelihood method what they try to do is to see the dispersion of the uh, of the different genes so all these points actually the the dots are actually the uh, the genes in your on in your data and it creates it tries to fit a curve by looking at the distribution of data so it sees that the data is actually going in a in a curve kind of a, on a way so what it does, tries to do is then to sh kind of bring all these values which are closer to this line to even more closer so they are more linear and they are not so diverse from each other but these all of these genes which are here have a higher uh, dispersion so they are very very far away from this line so what it tries it tries to avoid here because it would actually create overfitting so they have a kind of a balance in between uh overfitting and fitting which they do automatically inside the package once they do the dispersion then they then they use the generalized linear model what they do is they model the expression value of a gene by combining different factors which are important for the gene's expression so this is the formula which they use uh so this is the expression um a gene expression um, parameter and these are the different parameters and the factors which are used to calculate this value so a b c d are the different parameters from the data y is the gene expression and the different factors which they then multiply these these parameters with are the data which define your which define your uh, gene expression data in a sample like what is the sample type it was if it, if it was a treatment or a control what was the time point at which it was uh, uh, collected what was the dose what was the sample uh, if there is any other factor which sample can define and then they also use an error term to you know also include if there could be an error so error terms are very important because you can have errors due to various reasons and uh this in the end also uh, gives you uh, p values and this p values are then also corrected using a uh, uh, benjamin hogwer correction it's a very well known method which is used to correct the p values because p values become biased because when you test the genes thousand of times or hundred of times it it uh, i mean yeah it it tends to have sometimes very good values by chance so that's why benjamin hockwood method is you can maybe read about it more uh, on the internet but uh, but yeah i just wanted to introduce you to the terms which uh, the factors which they use while when in this package um so dsec2 have also um functions to deal with biological and technical replicates i know everybody has a different definition of biological and technical replicate but the way i see it is that biological replicates are from similar uh things like similar compound and but yeah but the lot or the vial is different for for a and b but the technical replicate would be from the same vial you have two more or three more technical replicates so what dsec to do is that at least you should like i told you before it should have at least three three biological replicates to see how much is the variability and if all the samples have are similar or not so this also like i told you before it's very very important that you have at least three replicates before you do the analysis and for the technical replicates uh, it has a function called collapse replicate so what does it does it kind of sums up the read counts from all different replicates into one so that's what it does before it does differential expression analysis so these are the two things which uh, you have to keep in mind and you have to also define in your metadata file that the samples are technical replicates or biological replicates based on the definition in which your particular 
lab or institute is using because uh, even within my own uh, project everybody had their own like different definition of biological and technical indicators but i just wanted to introduce you to this fact that there are different ways of dealing with biological and technical replicates then uh, the next step is actually to filter the genes so how do you know if these genes are significantly expressed or not so it's very very important that you have a, a threshold on a log fold change depending on how much log fold change you want to keep so there are different uh, parameters or the different functions you can also use in the dsec tool like this one here so it orders your or genes based on the log fold changes this one kind of creates a table of your genes which have a p adjusted value less than 0.05 so i would suggest the p adjusted value should be kept between 0.05 and 0 or 0.01 something like this then it gives you more a confidence that what you are seeing in the log fold changes is actually correct or not then the esec2 also offers an option to select the comparisons for example your interest so i i created some group ids in my in my data so i i i made this group id for gentamicin treated samples at 12 uh, 12 mu m concentration in 168 hour and this is the corresponding group id for the controls so i was interested in seeing what are the statistical values what are the log fold cha cha changes what are the p value adjusted p values which i would do which i would get if i compare my treated sample with the with the with their corresponding controls so these kind of things you can also uh, customize so to say and put it here uh, and see whatever you want to compare so this one is always the base and this one is in numerator and this is your denominator so i wanted to compare the treatment versus control so generally people always compare the treatment versus control but sometimes people also try to compare their treatment one uh, in which you have some concentration with the treatment two in which you have some another concentration so this is something which is flexible and you can get the statistics uh, for this particular condition now i would go into on to the on to the second last topic of our presentation today so that's the visualization like i showed you before there are various ways that you can visualize your data one such method is box plots so in the box plots what you can do you can see how similar is the distribution of your data so for example there's a condition aberal 1 sorry there's missing aberal 2 aberal 3 aberal 2 uh, and aberal 3 so you see the distribution of the data here is very very similar there are some genes which are highly expressed that's why they are on the uppermost uh, part of the of the graph but uh, but yeah most of the genes are very very similarly expressed and you see that the distribution of the data in the replicates are very very similar and also here as well you see that they are very similar to each other but like i showed you an example before there the replicate 3 did not have a very similar distribution of the raw read counts as in the other replicate so these kind of things you can also use use and uh, to show that how your data actually is to to also visualize for yourself how the distribution of your raw read count data is then you have another technique principal component analysis so what it tries to do it tries to show you how your different samples are clustering so if they are from same condition they are from the same group they should cluster very close to each other if they are not from the same group they wouldn't so you see all the green ones cluster very very close to each other these three green ones are very very close to each other so they might be very very similar to each other but maybe not this one and similarly here so you have a clear separation between the red points and between the green points and then also within the group you can see how similar or not so similar the the different samples are so it actually give you an overview of the variance in the samples the variance is always expected but it shouldn't be a lot of variance within a group because in the end they belong to the same condition so this is something which you can like i told you you can also use to visualize your data then you can use heat maps um i i'm sure you would have read about them or saw them a lot so this is a very nice method to actually see uh, how your different genes are expressing you know 
So it kind of here try to show you the similarity between the data. So you see that these set of genes look very, very similar in these conditions. These set of genes are highly expressed because they are on the upper part of the of the uh, this color bar. And these are like the down expressed genes because they are in the lower uh, part of the uh, color bar. So this color bar just show highly over expressed gene and highly uh, down expressed genes. So this is something which you can use and you know to extract the most highly expressed genes, show how their gene patterns are in different replicates. So here they are showing it in different replicates. You can also show it in different conditions. So, so how was it varying from condition one to condition? So this is something which you can also which you can also do using heat maps. Uh, so the last uh, part of my presentation is about the pathway enrichment analysis. I just want to introduce it to you. I know I have told you a lot of things in this <laughs> last uh, almost one hour now, but just want to give you an introduction to the pathway enrichment analysis. So once you have the genes, you would also like to see which pathways they are involved in. So there are a lot of pathway databases which are available online. So my favorite one is consensus pathway consensus path database because this database has integration has data from all the almost all the databases which are developed for mapping the genes to their pathways then you have another one called reactom you have wiki pathways and many other so once you have this this list of genes and pathways you also want to have a like a quality score for this pathway not quality score but something like ranking you know that if this pathway is overrepresented or is significant or not so for that you can have a, a mathematical function called z score which is actually to to show you if a pathway is overrepresented and significant or not this is a particular formula for that so in this uh, the small r is actually the number of so these are only the numbers so number of differentially expressed genes in a part so it is it is calculated for a particular condition okay so it's not for like whole uh, whole experiment but for every condition you can see if your pathway was activated for that condition or not so for a particular condition how many differentially did you have which belong to that pathway for which you are calculating the score capital r is in total which are how many are the number of differentially expressed genes and then uh, Oh, sorry then you have a uh, capital n which is the total number of genes in your data so for example in your tempo sig data you will have in total 3500 genes so that was capital n and small n is the total number of g differentially expressed genes in a condition so that means that how many total number of differentially expressed genes even if they belong to that particular or not irrespective of that how many total number of differentially expressed genes you have which you can get by setting the thresholds for the pre-adjusted and log for changes like i showed you before so that is that comes here after that when you get the score it's uh, you have to check if the score is greater than 1.96 it's it's a it's a threshold like you have for pre-adjusted value it means that your pathway is over represented and it is significant so this means that the probability of seeing this pathway being affected is more than the other pathways whose scores are less than 1.96 in a layman language. So this is a method which you can use to, to kind of be more sure about, yes, I see this pathway. The Z score looks really nice. That means that my pathway was activated when this particular drug or chemi chemical or compound was put on my cells. So this is a technique which can, you can also used to kind of reinforce your uh, yeah results and research what you have done so i think that is it uh, thank you so much and i want to thank tatiana and the rest of my my company's team uh, for giving me opportunity to <laughs> explore the field of infosec and also my supervisor thomas exner and the rest of the project team for uh, for which I got the data for the Temposic data, and my project which is funded by Mary Curie Innovative Brain. Um, thank you so much. So that's that was it from my side. If you have any questions, you can ask now.
I mean, if you cannot ask, you can also write it in the chat box if you like. So whatever you guys prefer to do. So I can be. Uh, I have. A... Yes. Regarding the visualization. Yeah. The box plot. Yeah. Uh, I thought it, it's very similar to uh, the control because in both we are seeing the differentially expressed genes. Or am I wrong? You, for what exactly? Sorry. Yeah, I, I saw that it's uh, very similar to when we did the the control, like we we yeah. were seeing the differentially expressed genes. What's what's the difference between both of them? There's no difference. So they are both box plots. But I just introduced you a little bit more in this part that you can use it also to visualize your data. So just to see some of the so it's yeah. the same thing. Yeah. In the example before, I just showed you the problem which you can also detect using this box plots because you saw that the third replicate had a very low read count as compared to other two replicates, which kind of flagged the problem, you know, that there is a problem with your third replicate. So that's what I wanted to show there. But in, in principle, it's the same thing. But the graphs are different. So the example which I've used here is different than the one I showed you. Oh, so I can just do the, the control without doing the vis uh, visualization uh, in, uh, like this, uh, like in this slide. I can, uh, you know, I can just use the control and uh, know how uh, the differentially expressed genes are. Yeah, but without doing the yeah, but I think the quality control is very because you will not have data without the replicates. So you have to check if your replicates are really similar to each other or not. If they're not similar, after you normalize the data, after you have the differential expression, so you will get to the point where you'll have the statistics for your particular genes. But then you are not sure if they're right or not. So you have to do the quality control before you do any any further analysis. So all these things have to be done. So this this thing is done on raw read count data. Sorry, maybe I forgot to mention it. So this is done on the raw, raw read count data before you do any analysis. So it's very important to do such kind of things to see that what data you are going to use to analyze is actually right, it looks okay or not. So never proceed without <laughs> doing a quality control. You know, there are just few okay. techniques which I mentioned. I mean, there are any other techniques also, like I told before, that you can calculate Pearson coefficient, correlation coefficients to check how similar your different uh, samples are within a group, how similar your biological replicates are to each other. So this could also be done using those Pearson coefficient, uh, correlation coefficient. Such kind of measures can also be used if you do not want the visualization method. I mean. But this visualization method can already kind of indicate or give you a flag that, you know, you have to check your data before you move forward, for, further. Uh, okay, good. Thank you. No problem. So, so yeah, thank you so much, guys. And again, sorry for the miscommunication. Uh, I hope I did not ruin your eve, Friday evening. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I, and I hope that it was useful for all of you.